Love that sound. Okay. Welcome to Evolution Now Project. This is the 14th podcast that we're doing. I'm your host, Damien Schnappy, along with J.J. Wolf. And before we get to our guest, I'm just going to read a quote that'll set up the podcast. So there's a war that wages in every person. There's a part of us that wants to be lost and a part that wants to be found. And it's how we reconcile these two opposite parts of ourselves that will determine our success. Because the journey to greatness requires both isolation and connection. So our guest today is an entrepreneur. She's a health and wellness advocate and an influencer. She's done her fair share of travel and public speaking. It's our pleasure to welcome to the Evolution Now Project, Nafsika Zacharias. <laughs> Close enough, Zacharias. <laughs> Welcome, welcome. Welcome. Guys, excited to be here. Cool, cool. So, uh, Nafsika, um, just to kick it off, uh, what inspired you to undertake this path of wellness? Um, and if you want to just intro yourself and talk a little bit about, yeah. about what it is that, that you do in your professional realm. Yeah, I'm like, how much time do we have? Because I feel like wellness journeys start before they actually begin. If anyone has ever been on a wellness journey, it takes a line in the sand moment in my experience and a lot of buildup if you're not normally like a really healthy person. And so for myself personally, my wellness journey started um, back in... 2013, when I was in college, I actually got into bodybuilding. Um, and that was like before I think females were doing a lot of bodybuilding. And I remember like always sticking out. Like I was at the gym, I was lifting really heavy. I was putting on lean muscle and everyone was always staring at me. Luckily I had one other friend that would work out with me. So her and I were just like these crazy girls in the gym, like lifting super heavy, like dressed in, you know, the bodybuilders outfits and everything. And that's really when my wellness journey started. Um, I went on stage, I competed, I did the whole thing. And then when I graduated college, I was really looking for more of a sustainable lifestyle. For me, bodybuilding specifically was not sustainable. So I was working full time. I was in the medical field. Um, and I just was really burned out and tired from trying to meal prep and lift really heavy and do all these things. So I ended up, you know, talking to friends about the, my struggle with my health personally. Um, at that point I was struggling with just not a lot of energy inflammation in my body. Um, and I was looking for something that was really going to support support and guide me in like a system and really get answers. I think when we're on a wellness journey, we're like looking for answers. Like what's going to make me feel good. What do I take? Like, you know, am I doing supplements? Am I not taking supplements? Like is caffeine good for me? Is it bad for me? Am I supposed to like eat meat? Am I not supposed to eat meat? Is fish good? Like there's so many questions and I was looking for answers. And as I started finding the answers, I wanted to share that with other people and I love that I'm on a podcast with two guys because most of the women that I work with are, are most people that I work with are women. Um, but that's neither here nor there because I think that guys can relate to a lot of this as well. But, um, you know, that was really the beginning of my wellness journey. And as I started getting answers, people started asking me for the answers as well. And I was it's like, okay, well, I need to share this with people. I need to share like what I've learned um, on a larger scale and really showcase like what I have found that's worked for me, even though everyone is different. So really that's what I do today is like offer people answers. Obviously everybody is different. I'm not like a doctor. I'm not a nutritionist. You know, I tell people that stuff all the time, but I'm just somebody who is really an advocate for wellness and and um, people being an advocate for themselves as well. That's so beautiful to hear your journey and, you know, how it started out with the, you know, bodybuilding and then your own inquiry into, you know, what is what is good and bad for your body as far as caffeine or fish or, you know, it's like heavy metals or is it, you know, wild caught salmon or is it farm tilapia or whatever it is. Um, that's beautiful and people being advocates for themselves. So in this whole journey, uh, how did you turn all of this into an entrepreneurial venture? Yeah, it, for me, it really like it 
was a personal, everything always starts, I think, at least for me, as I'm reflecting with a personal struggle. And I, you know, my wellness journey started with a personal struggle with like my body, right? Not feeling good in my body. My entrepreneurial journey started with a business struggle. Um, I was working in the medical field in Boston. I moved across the country to California. I just needed a change. I didn't have a job when I moved to California. I had like no money. We didn't know where I was going to live. Didn't know what I was going to do for work. I got into sales. That was like the only thing that would hire me, like literally telemarketing phone sales. And I was like, I got to pay my bills. Hold on, I'm going to figure this thing out. I like at first hated sales. I had all the negative, you know, assumptions around what sales was and what that looked like. But I was like, you know what? I got to learn this skill. I got to figure this thing out. So I got into doing that, which really I'm so grateful for because it was a beautiful platform for entrepreneurship. Like I, when I got to really learn and understand sales, I was like, oh, everything is sales. Like if you just change the perspective on it, then like everything is sales. Like you're selling yourself to your partner. If you're in a relationship, you're selling yourself to your friends to like continue to be friends with you and want to hang out with you. You know, like when you're in a job interview, like you're just selling yourself to get hired. And so I really changed my perspective on sales and it was, I'm so grateful because that position taught me so much. And I ended up growing in the company, becoming a sales manager, um, being able to learn leadership on somebody else's dime, which I think is so awesome because in entrepreneurship, it's like, it's on your dime. Like if you mess something up, like you're probably losing money or you're losing time, which can be money. But when you're working for somebody else and you can kind of like learn the skills of sales and they're still paying you whether or not you mess up or you can learn the leadership skills and they can still pay you whether or not you're doing good as a leader. That was just such a blessing in my life. And so I did that with sales. And then when 2020, March of 2020 happened and everything, the world was shifting, going crazy. I was working from home. And I had this moment where I was like, my company is probably going to go under. And I didn't think it was going to happen immediately, but I could kind of feel intuitively that things with corporate were changing. And I was like, I'm screwed if this happens because all my eggs are in one basket. I don't have any other streams of income. I'm living in San Diego. My expenses are high. If I lose my income, like, what am I going to do? And that's when I was like, I need to start my own business. Like I need to get into entrepreneurship and do it on the side of working full time because I have my full time income to lean back on. I don't have to have this like desperate feeling of like the sales or the entrepreneurship, like, oh my God, I have to make this work. It's like, I have a backup plan and with my, with my job. And that was really like the transitional moment for me where I was like, okay, like I can't allow my income to be dependent on someone else because you never know, nothing is guaranteed in life. And, um, I knew I could bet on myself. I was like, I can trust myself to get me to where I want to go. And that was really the leap into entrepreneurship was like that transition. Yeah, and I agree. Sales is everything. You're selling yourself. If you're trying to sell a product, if you're in a relationship, and you have to sell yourself on yourself. So I'm curious, how have you leveled up in your ability to to sell yourself, your product, and follow up? What's the biggest obstacle obstacle you encounter when selling your product? Good questions. I love this because I always tell my team and the people that I lead that personal development and mindset is everything. We had a call this morning at 6 30 in the morning. It was 30 minutes and it was all about mindset, personal development, you know, your belief in yourself. So I love that you're selling, selling yourself on yourself because that's like self-belief. So I one of the biggest things that I do personally daily is like journaling. I've been journaling for like eight years. I want to say now I had a lot of resistance to it at first. Nate has his journal. Um, and I just, for me, journaling can look like so many different things, but if I don't have time to read or I don't want to meditate, cause I just be honest, don't like it. Okay. We probably need it even more because I have a lot of resistance to it, which I understand. 
Uh, but journaling is something that now comes easily to me. So I'll do like stream of consciousness journaling where I just like, will let everything out on paper, all the crazy thoughts in my mind, write them on paper, get rid of them. So they're not circling anymore. And then something that I've been doing really recently that I actually found on Instagram was best case scenario journaling. So like if I'm selling myself on myself, I'll write out like, what's the best case scenario for today? Like, what's the best case scenario for this podcast recording? What's the best case scenario for my meetings? Like, what's the best case scenario for my sales team this month? Like, what does that really get to look like? And it's a process of manifestation and like what we focus on, we find. So if I focus on the best case scenario, then I'm probably going to find the best case scenario and really create that in my reality. So so that's like something that even if I'm feeling down on myself because that happens like probably multiple times a week. I can like think about best case scenario for myself and really like get myself re-enrolled, re-excited about what I'm doing. I think especially with entrepreneurship, I always say like, you have to recruit yourself every single day, right? And like, kind of like gas yourself up, like put yourself in that state, get excited, do the things that you need to do to get there. So um. I, I, that was, I think the first part of your question. The second part was, I think about selling a product, right? The, the obstacle people like, Oh, I don't really feel like I need that or it's too expensive or, you know, Yes. Yeah. I love the high pitched voice when we talk about objections. I feel like our voice changes when we're like pretending, you know, to be somebody else. So one of the biggest obstacles that we face, like with our team in general, not just me, but with the team is there's a lot of noise out there, like period. Okay. So like what I was saying earlier with my story is like, do I have fish or do I have meat? Do I need to go vegan? Do I have to go dairy free? Do I have to, can I have caffeine? Can I not? Can I drink alcohol? Like all, there's so much noise and so many questions out there. So especially with social media, we do a lot of our sales on social media. And even if we go to networking groups or we go to like wellness events or things like that, people are always wondering like, how is this different from something else? Is this actually good for me? Is this actually healthy? People are really jaded. Like they're really skeptical because they have been burned. Most of the people that are having those objections, like it's too expensive. Do I need this? Like, what is this? thing. My experience is that they have, it's not that they don't want to invest or they don't believe in it. It's that they have in the past and they've been burned, right? They've invested hundreds or thousands of dollars in something and then it hasn't worked or it hasn't tasted good, or they hired a coach or a personal trainer or something. And they didn't get the results they wanted or the person ghosted them or they was a bait and switch, whatever it was. So I think that overcoming the like jadedness and getting people to trust us is something that I teach my team all the time. Like being authentic online, you know, being real, not just saying how good something is of a product that we have, but also sharing like Maybe that it doesn't always taste good. Like I have my girls like talk about the real stuff online. So people aren't just like, oh, like Nafsik is only saying all the benefits. Like she's not saying there's got to be something that isn't perfect about her products or about her business. So when I can kind of share like, yeah, here's the crappy parts about this. Like you might feel this way. You might X, Y, Z. Then I think it builds a level of trust with others as well. That is so huge is building trust, right? Because people people do business and buy things from people that they know, like, and trust, as the adage goes. Uh, Damien, I think you had another thing that you were going to bring up, um, perhaps. I, I do. I wanted to touch upon journaling because I know JJ is a big journaler. And now I know that you are, and I am too. So I'm curious, you know, I journaled for years, and then it wasn't until 2020 when I realized, hey, I'm going through the same patterns. I made this same journal entry five weeks ago. So what I started to do was, because in 2020, the world shut down, we're at home, we're isolated. I needed to take the structure of a nine to five into the like just chunk of time. So every weekend I would create a collection point. I go back over the last week of journaling and I pull out the key insights. And I'm curious, have you ever gone back and read your previous week so that on the week upcoming, you can build on the lessons you learned and extend that? I love this. 
No and yes, like not in that capacity, but I have gone back. So I love that you brought up this point because every year at the end of the year, like December 31st, I'll go back through my, all my journal entries from the year before. And I won't read every single one. I'll kind of like skim and then maybe read a page and then read a couple sentences here and skip back. And I started doing that a couple of years ago and a couple of years ago. And I think the review is so important. I love the weekly review. I'm like, I'm gonna take notes and do that too, because I think the review, it allowed me at least personally to see over a year how negative I was. I was like, wow, Mm. my journaling is literally me complaining every single day. Like there's barely any gratitude in there. Like all I'm doing, like if I do the stream of consciousness journaling, right? Like there's a, I don't know what the number is, so I'm not even going to like say a number, but so many of our thoughts per day are negative and their previous patterns from like the day before, right? Like we're just kind of like running on autopilot. So our body and our brain can save energy and our mind wants to protect us, right? Like that's just like what it's there for, which means that it's going to be negative. It's going to be like, watch out for this. Don't do this. It hates risk. It hates getting out of our routine and getting out of our comfort zone. And so when I did my review, I was like, this is so bad. Like everything is negative in here. Like, of course I'm like sad, or of course I'm anxious or worried about things. And that allowed me to like break, start breaking that pattern and being like, how do I get to focus on the positives? So best case scenario journaling comes in and like, is super powerful on. Um, I love the weekly review. I definitely want to be implementing that. I think there is a space for brain dumping and stream of consciousness and just getting it all out. But I would just throw that away. Like I would burn it. I would rip it up. I would throw it away. Stream of consciousness journaling, in my opinion, doesn't need to stay in a journal. Like Like it doesn't need to be in there anymore. It's like negative stagnant energy that we just need to release. So if you're going to be reviewing your stuff on a weekly basis or a yearly basis like me, I would just not want to have that in there. Right. And JJ, to your previous point, now what you were referring to uh, before, this leads perfectly into it. So there's a quote, you may recognize it. Being a self-aware human is a trip. There's a level of personal responsibility that comes with it. Being a self-cleaning oven, so to speak, where you're cleaning up your own energy while understanding your triggers and your needs and your gaps. Now, obviously, that's a post that you made. And self-cleaning oven, which I think the, the mind dump, the journaling is a part of it because what you have just communicated to us is that in your journaling as you're dumping, you are conditioning yourself to connect the positive so that's why you're you're really coming out of autopilot and i love that term because i think it's 90 percent of the thoughts are just recycled thoughts and a lot of it's negative because it's fear reverse and it's pain avoidance so i like this idea of the spectrum right fear is the vehicle that brings you to courage so negativity the awareness of negativity allows you to build a sense of positivity that's stronger than your immediate surroundings and your immediate conditioned reactions So what is it to you if you want to further expand on being a self-cleaning oven? And then after, I'd love to hear JJ's thoughts on that, too, because I know he's very introspective. So self-cleaning oven, Nafsika, what is that? Yeah. So I can't take um, credit for that term because I actually did an emotional intelligence leadership course in San Diego. Um, And one of my mentors and coaches in that course would always talk about being a self-cleaning oven and what that meant to her. And like what that means to me is like cleaning up your shit for lack of a better word, on a daily basis, right? Like if you think about an oven that cleans itself, if it's dirty, it's like, okay, let's, you know, get, get rid of the debris and let's work properly. And for me, I think, like I said, in that post, when we're self-aware and we can be aware of our thoughts and we can be aware of our actions or our triggers or our patterns or our habits, then it allows us to like clean it up for things that we don't like. Cause I will be like, Oh, I just like judged that person. I didn't like that thought. Like, let me just like remove it, like cancel, cancel. And like, let me think of a loving and positive thought towards that person. Or I'll be like, you know what? Like I'm feeling a little bit of like resentment resentment towards that person. Like, why am I feeling that? Like what's coming up for me? And it's, 
being a self-cleaning oven in me is like being really curious about my own thoughts, not judging myself for it and being like, oh my God, you're a horrible person because you're judging somebody else or you're feeling resentment, but really having compassion for myself and being like, why do I feel that way? Like what is really coming up for me? What is that person mirroring back to me that I don't like about myself or that I wish I had in me? Um, and that is really like, for me, that, that kind of like self cleaningness of like, okay, the things that I don't really like about myself or the shadow, a lot of people talk about like shadow work or shadow parts of ourselves. How do we, you can't eliminate them, right? Like they're going to be there, but how do you continue to mitigate them? How do you continue to be aware of them? How do you continue to move forward despite them and not let them really hold you back? Love it. JJ. So I love to hear, how do you, how do you, how are you a self-cleaning oven? What do you do? Do you, any, do you do similar things as, as Napsica or do you have a different method? Well, thanks for passing the mic. Wow. It's just so beautiful to, to have these types of conversations and to tune into this uh, journey of life with people and hear about, you know, what is their introspective process like, you know, so, so often I feel like I'm going to the grocery store or walking to the park or whatever. And sometimes it can feel like people are NPCs, like non-player characters. It's like some people feel like they have depth and some people feel like they're just autonomous, whatever. Um, but yeah, you know, self-cleaning oven is, you know, it's check yourself. It's, you know, uh, personal responsibility. And um, there's a quote I like that's, we don't see the world as it is. We see, we see the world as we are, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so when we, like, if I see somebody that has a Lamborghini, my younger self might go, ah, oh, why, you know, why does that jerk have a Lamborghini? And I've really done a lot with the journaling and just self-awareness process to get to a place where, I'm, you know, looking up to and respecting people that have earned their place in the world, you know, whatever their journey has been, they've had to work hard to get there and to maintain it in whatever way. So as far as being a self-cleaning oven, my processes are periodic review, you know, is um, I journal at least three to five times a week. Sometimes I journal almost every day. Um, and I'm more on a monthly review than a weekly review, but often I'll go through my journals with, uh, with a highlighter and I'll just, you know, kind of just highlight some random things, or if I don't have a highlighter, I'll just take a pen and just circle things or underline things. And then if I happen to look back at it again, or, or while I'm journaling, sometimes if something's like, like a really top of mind or a profound insight, I'll star it or something. And so as I'm reviewing my notes, I'll, I'll then kind of tune into those, you know, what's underlined or what's highlighted. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it comes down to like habits of awareness and building those habits, you know, just like the habits of, of mind. Like what, what is the first thought you have when you wake up? Is it, is it automatic? Is it subconscious? Is it a, a reaction to looking at Instagram, <laughs> you know? This morning, I actually had a, a, a really, really wonderful realization. I just didn't look at my phone. I've been looking at my phone too soon after waking up for the last few weeks. And this morning, I didn't look at my phone for the first three hours of my day. And I feel like supercharged. I feel like all my positive subconscious phrases and like inner self-talk are, are just running strong this morning. I did some exercise. I journaled a little bit, I read a little bit and, you know, I just feel, I feel clear, um, because I've, I've gone through these, these correct, correct, um, habits of awareness for myself. So being a self-cleaning oven is, is, a, is about periodic, um, review of, uh, of your, of your thoughts and behaviors and actions. I don't know if, if I, any of that uh, brings up any, any thoughts from other of you, maybe Damien, you want to respond on your thoughts about oh. Yourself oh, in the oven and your your journaling and a hundred percent. It's 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 the responsibility. It's the responsibility of owning everything that you do. Mm. And Nafska said something about the shadow. Carl Jung. I like the quote that he has. It's if I am substantial, how can I not cast a shadow? And mm. there's a a therapy called internal family systems therapy. It believes it was created by a guy named Richard Schwartz, and he believes that. 
as I do, we are a multiplicity. We have different parts. We have the judgmental, aggressive part. We have the loving, compassionate part. We have the child part. We have the curious part. And you said something great, Nafsika, the curiosity. It's like curiosity transcends everything because you're like, oh, that's interesting. Where can we go with that? Or what's that about? And I found that having compassion towards these different parts of ourselves allows us to break the pattern of being like, oh, that's a bad thought, or I don't want to think that. And you start to warmly accept it, because if you resist something, it will persist. And I love the idea that the more you you journal and review, you find these things that are unconscious triggers or habits, and you bring them into the light. And that way, you better understand like, wow, I didn't think I was the type of person that could think or say that. And that when you have that realization, you have more compassion towards people out in the world, which I would say completely increases your ability to connect, which is at the heart of selling. You are coming up with a solution for, for life's problems and that you are curious as to how you can solve those problems. So I love the idea of a self-cleaning oven. I love the idea that you're going to leadership seminars. And another question was, so what's another thing that you do to build your emotional IQ? Oh, um, I would say like, taking action around having really uncomfortable conversations at the heart of our team, right? I run a large sales organization and one of our team values and the culture of our team is we don't sweep anything under the rug. So anything that comes up, we discuss, we talk about it. Another mantra that we have is clear is kind. So being clear with someone, having clear conversations, having clarity around what's going on is so important. So literally, perfect example, five minutes before this podcast recording, I'm in my team chat and one of my girls on my team is asking a question and she's asking for feedback. She's like, I'm struggling with X, Y, Z in my business right now what do you guys think is going wrong? Like, what am I doing? And I got to be really honest with her literally five minutes before this call. I was like, Hey, this is my experience of you on social media. It was about her social media post specifically. And I got to be really honest with her and clear from a place of love because she asked for it. She asked for feedback. She asked for coaching. And I got to really tell her like, Hey, you know, it doesn't really seem like you're very personal online. Like, this is what I'm noticing about your posts. Like, like, this is what I would keep doing. This is what I wouldn't keep doing. And that is just a standard on our team that we have those types of conversations. We ask each other for feedback. We ask each other for, you know, what we can improve on and what we could change and what we could shift. And especially working with like 80% women, um, there's a lot of emotions that can come up. Like we're very emotional beings and we have a lot going on. And then being in sales, it's like, that's even emotional too, because then you're taking things personally and you're getting rejected and you're putting yourself out there over and over and over again. And so when we can have these honest, direct, uncomfortable conversations, it builds our EQ because we can not take that feedback personally. We can grow from it. We can like desire and crave those uncomfortable conversations because we know there's going to be growth on the other side of that. And I, I just believe that being in the trenches and taking action and doing the do is what's going to build your EQ the most. Like you could journal all day. You could be a self-cleaning oven all day. You could be really introspective. You could sit and reflect and be really curious, but that's only going to get you so far. Like Brene Brown, I love her trainings and her books and her Netflix, like docu-series that she has around like being in the arena. Like when you're in the arena and you're fighting the fight and you're playing the game, that's when you're going to grow the most. Those are the people that you want to surround yourself with the most versus like the spectators who are like in the stands and they're the fans and they're watching. Um, so that's what I would say. That's huge. That's huge. Yeah. You, you want to interact with the people that are in the arena, the people that are actually doing the do and uh, not, not the spectators. I love that. And um, clear is kind, clear is kind. That's a really beautiful, beautiful uh, way to put that. And yeah, you know, it's, um, 
you know, bringing things to light, you know, in a metaphorical sense and in a literal sense. Um, I was just living in Costa Rica for a while and <laughs> I, it's very humid there. And I had a lot of things that would get like musty and mildewy in the closet. And I would literally have to take things out of the dark and bring them into the light to clean, <laughs> to clean things up, you know? And um, yeah, that's beautiful. And to, to have, it takes courage and, and it takes a, a certain level of maturity to be able to handle critical feedback and honest feedback, but it is, it is the kindest thing that we can do. You know, it's like, it's like that really funny comedic anecdote is like, you know, if two people are having a conversation and somebody's got some food on their face, like, you know, or you're at a networking party and your friend yes. got some spinach in their tooth, right? You know, if, if you don't say something, you're a jerk, right? Like, you know, you got to tell somebody as soon as possible, like, Hey, you got some lipstick like on your cheek, like you want to clean that up. <laughs> um, not to move ahead too fast, but we do have another um, question in our in our uh, flow for this podcast episode, which is, um, what is the last thing that really inspired you? And how have you carried that inspiration in your life, in your business, in your relationships? Oh, I love this question. The well, first thing that comes to mind is I have a mentor and she is so gracious and very grounded through adversity. And that is so inspiring to me um, because I tend to, when there's adversity, like I want to fight and I want to like have words. Like I'm from Boston. She's from Boston too, actually. But like, I'm from the East coast. I'm like, no one's going to mess with me. Like, let's go. Like, I'm going to have words with you. Like maybe that's the shadow part of me or whatever. Right. Like the drama, the like cattiness, whatever. Right. I think as women, especially that can be like a knee jerk reaction. And this woman has inspired me so much to love on people and share kindness with them, even when they have betrayed me. Like there's been some things that have happened in my business where I have felt betrayed. You know, it has been negative. There's been like drama, so to speak, or toxicity. And my like lower self, I guess, wants to match toxicity with toxicity, wants to be like, oh, you want to fight? Like, let's fight. Like, you want to be negative? Like, let's be negative. You want to like talk shit? Like, let's talk shit. You know, like that's like what I want to do. And I've been really inspired with this woman to be like, I'm taking the high road. Like I am not feeding into that. I am moving forward graciously. Like you can say what you want to say. You can blast whatever you want to blast on Instagram or wherever, but I'm going to move forward in this way with love and light and compassion and grace. And that has been so inspiring to me. Um, she's also inspired me, same woman to really take the emotions out of business as much as possible. Because in the past, I would just be super emotional and I would cry and I would feel sorry for myself and like be really upset. And she's really taught me to like have that CEO mindset. Like is a CEO of a multi-billion dollar company going to cry if somebody quits, like one of their employees quits or somebody leaves them or somebody blasts them on social media? Like, no, they're going to move on with their day. They have bigger and better things that they need to do and more work that gets to get done. And I have like really gotten caught up on those little things and let myself be hung up on those. But she has really inspired me to like have that emotional maturity, take the high road, not match that toxicity or negativity. And I think having mentors and examples in our lives is so important because it's like a shining light, like a beacon of who we want to be. And we can follow that because we see an example. Yeah, that's so great answer. Um, Oh, sorry. Sorry to, to jump. Yeah, I, I had a bunch of things on my mind. I mean, would, would you like to? E e please. So a lot of great stuff is in that answer. I mean, look, I, I think awareness is the, is the, the, one of the strongest tools in the game of change. And what you just demonstrated was your emotional awareness of the full spectrum, the shadow, the part that wants to fight. But you also use that as the vehicle to, to put forth your light. So that's the signs of being a, a fully integrated person who has a inner unity because you're not like trying to suppress the shadow. You're going, OK, I could take that road, but I'm going to take the high road. And the, the difference between 
fighting a betrayal and forgiveness is it's like the difference between like, I'm going to walk to Boston from Worcester or I'm going to take the highway and you're taking the highway. So that's great. And I think on another level, when you increase your emotional IQ, you increase your perspective and you're able to zoom out like the CEO is not going to cry over somebody that quits. They're going to go, okay, in the next 24 hours to 48 hours to a month, is it going to be a pain in the ass to, to replace this person? Sure. In the overall context of building an empire, it's a drop in the hat. So I, I love that you that you know all that stuff and that you're able to articulate it because you're doing that kind of work that allows you to go, hey, this is where I'm at in my journey and this is where I'm going. And to go there, uh, my final part of the thought was the, the clearest kind is you get greater comfort by embracing discomfort. So look, you never get rid of uncertainty or the unknown. It's always greater than the known, but your relationship, your relationship to discomfort allows you to, to move past those immediate responses that keep you small and that you get to appeal to that higher self more and more. So I, that's beautiful. Well said, JJ. Oh, wow. I mean, it's just so much. I mean, it's it's even just it's it's such an art form to be in these, you know, deep conversations, you know, and um, I, I love it so much. Um, the, the power that comes from being responsive and not reactive is is one of the greatest skills in, in personal and professional life, you know, to not become argumentative, to not become you know, a fireball of emotion, you know, even when somebody ticks you off or quits unexpectedly. Um, and I think that ability to be, I like the word diplomatic, you know, in a sense that, you, you, you know, you have to represent your character and your business in a respectable way. And to take that pause, you know, almost taking from the, the stoic philosophy, but to be, to be stoic, and to breathe and then to respond intelligently and thoughtfully instead of reacting with a hey go fuck yourself <laughs> you want to be present and um and to be responsive and be diplomatic you know um yeah um i guess i'll, I'll i'm going to jump into the next thing that we were going to ask which is uh what habits napsica what habits do you attribute your success online to this is, I love this. So the first thing you said this earlier, JJ, was about this morning, you didn't look at your phone. And this is kind of like backwards because we're talking about success online. But I will tell you, I think that one of the biggest habits that I have that has contributed to my success online is not looking at my phone first thing in the morning. I haven't looked at my phone first thing in the morning, like in years. So my phone's on airplane mode when I'm sleeping. I My team knows like they're not getting contact with me for the first hour or two that I'm up in the morning. That's like sacred time that I'm exercising or doing my morning routine or whatever that is. And I think that that's one of the habits that's contributed to my success online because I am being responsive versus being reactive online. I'm not checking things online first thing in the morning so that when I do go online, it's on my terms. It's like, okay, I'm ready to be inundated with information. When I turn my phone on and I open Instagram or I open Facebook, I'm like, okay, now here I am going to be a consumer and going to be a creator at the same time. And it, it allows intentionality and that responsiveness, like you said, versus being reactive. So that's the first thing I'll do and a really powerful habit for having success online, which is like, don't go online. Like that's one of my successes. Like don't go online right away. Um, also, I think I am just messy online. Like I'm real. Like if you watch my stories, like the other day, somebody actually made a comment when I saw them in person, I like had a stain on my shirt and I was taking a like recording of a story and I was like, Oh my God, you guys like, there's a stain on my shirt. Like, where did this even come from? Okay, whatever. And then I just keep going with like, whatever, whatever I was even saying in that moment. And I don't make it perfect. Like I'll show up on there, like my hair and makeup, not done. I'm like sweating. I'm running around. Like there's, you can't really hear the audio that well. Like it's just people know they're going to get the authentic version of me that isn't always curated and, and professional. There is a lot of 
professionalism on there as well, but there's a good balance. I also think that, um, having a habit of showing up consistently, I have been the most inconsistent person in the past. And then I have been super consistent. And for me, social media is a big part of my job and my entrepreneurial venture. And so I have to be on social media. Like it is for my team. It's for myself. It's for clients, future clients on where I'm going with like my career. And one of the habits that I have is just doing it even when I don't want to. I tell the girls on my team all the time, you're not going to feel like going on your story. You're not going to feel like going live on Instagram. You're not going to feel like making two reels today and posting them, but you have to do it anyways, even if you don't feel like it. Like it doesn't matter that you don't feel like it. If I do most things that I don't feel like doing on a daily basis. So having that habit of not worrying about my feelings on whether or not something feels like I feels right or feels wrong or feels good or feels like I want to do it doesn't matter. So that's another habit that I implement all of the time. Um, and sometimes the consistency is just like putting something up that doesn't take a lot of time. Like it doesn't need to take a lot of time, post something. Um, I, the last thing I'll say is like one of the habits that I have is like multitasking in a way like that quote that you guys read about the post that I made, I wrote that while I was on a walk. And I feel like I get my most inspiration when I'm outside and I'm moving my body and I'm walking and I'm listening to music and I'm thinking about things. And like, then I'll just start typing out posts or I'll be like, Oh, this is a really good caption for something. or Oh, I'm thinking about this thing. And that means that I'm not just sitting down. I think a lot of people for social media think like, I need to sit down. I need to write out all my ideas. I need to do all my stuff like in that moment. And I'm like, no, I'm usually doing multiple things at once. And then thinking of an idea in that moment to then implement in the future. So good. That is just so good. And my, my favorite quote related to doing what you don't want to do is that discipline is doing what you don't feel. No, sorry. Discipline is doing what you know you need to do, even and especially when you don't feel like doing it. I can tell Damien's chomping at the bit to get something out. There's so much that you said, Nausicaa, that I know that he's going to chime in on and love. To respond. Yeah, so just to, the, both the points you guys said, not looking at your phone, I also adopted that. Um, in 2020, I, I, I realized that when you look at your phone, you are training yourself to give your attention to everything except the thing that can help you the most, and that's yourself. You're literally saying, hey, this person's important, this is that, buy that, do that. So the first 20 minutes are so essential, it's because we just get, we we wake up from sleep and our brain waves are in theta. And that's like the waves associated with hypnotism. So the first 20 minutes of your day, you can hypnotize yourself, you can set your trajectory. So as a successful entrepreneur, you know that what you say to yourself, what you listen to, how you move your body, what you put into your body is so fundamental. It's like, what plants are, what are you, what are you planting? Are you planting weeds? Are you, are you planted sunflowers? Are you planting a beautiful garden? So I absolutely love that. And this kind of came to mind. Um, correction creates correction. That's, that's the need for community. You know, you have your team and said, Hey, you, you gotta be stronger than your feelings. And that's an amazing thing because the mind, in my opinion, is like a, it's a machine and you build this this vehicle of awareness that allows you to change and use the things that come into you passively so that you can actively engage with greater parts of yourself that are going to be stronger and more positive in face of all the negativity and the discomfort. And so my question that pops up is obviously you're a really connected person. You're online. You're talking to a, a lot of people. So the opening quote of this podcast I actually had on a walk. So to your point, when you're moving, the brain just works better. And it's like you're you're receptive and you 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 pick up on that radio station, and you tune it, a little static, but when you calm yourself and go, okay, what is this? And you allow your mind, which is very much like an antenna, an instrument, to receive the wisdom of the universe, you can really embody it. And so I wanted to ask, so how do you balance the need to be alone, to be isolated with the need for community? What's that balance look like for you? This is, I love this question. And you were, you were tuned in because literally yesterday, um, I dropped off my friend at the airport and she's been with me for a week 
And we had such a best time. We went to the Beyonce concert. It was amazing. Like she's like a sister to me. And I spend a lot of time alone outside of what I do for work. People think like I'm, I am extroverted for sure. I'm going to networking groups. I'm, I'm running my team out here in Arizona that I have friends coming to visit. But I realized like yesterday when I was dropping off at the airport, I was like, I actually do spend a lot of time alone. Like I live alone. I like work out, you know, I do certain things. I do my morning routine. I do my evening routine. And I've really created these boundaries for myself, knowing what I need and when, and because I am an extrovert, I do gain energy from being around other people, being busy, being on calls, going out and about like that does fill up my cup and pours into me. And I also need to like, make sure I'm not socially exhausted, you know, and make sure that I am having that time alone to recharge and just not have to talk to anybody, you know, and, and just like not have to perform or show up a certain type of way or be on like, so to speak. So I think I have figured out that balance. I don't really like the word balance. So I will say like, I figured out how to navigate that. Cause I don't believe in balance in life. I think we have seasons of like the pendulum swinging one way where like, maybe I'm very social or very community oriented. And then sometimes it's swinging the other way where I'm like spending more time alone and, and whatnot. But I think I figured out when not always, but I'm doing better figuring out when I need what, like, am I craving alone time right now? Or am I craving time to be around other people and, you know, be plugged in? And again, there's, we've talked so much about being a self-aware human and being introspective and really asking ourselves what we need. And so I can kind of like tune in and be like, ask, just ask yourself questions. Like, what do I need right now? And then just like answer it. Like, don't overthink it. Just be like, what do I need right now? Like, do I need to go and be around people or do I need to be alone? You know? And one of my favorite things to do is go somewhere where I know there's going to be people, but I might not know them, but I get to like be around them. Right. So like going on a hike, for example, or going to a fitness class where like, I don't know anyone there and I don't necessarily need to socialize, but like, I don't need to work out alone. And so I can have this like balance of doing things like that, um, that support myself. But when I can ask myself, what do I need right now? Then I can answer like, you know, I just want to chill. And I just want to have a day for myself, like a self-care day where I get to relax. And then sometimes I'm like, no, like I need to be around girlfriends or I need to be around people or I need to do X, Y, Z. And sometimes I get it wrong. And I'm like, that was not the right thing for me to do. And that's okay. Cause again, we can shift, we can change. We just continue to learn about ourselves over and over again. Yeah. Continuing to learn about ourselves over and over again. I like, you know, I can really tune into that that feeling of like not necessarily wanting to go do something with other people, but wanting to be around other people. I actually just made a huge monumental shift in my life. Um, so I'm from Boston as well. Um, we met in Boston maybe five or six years ago. And um, I've been living in Costa Rica the last few years. But before I was in Costa Rica, I had moved to Miami and I was living in Miami for a year and a half. I went to Costa Rica at the beginning of 2020. And then the world shut down and I do video production in person, especially in events. And so I just stayed in Costa Rica and then I got really comfortable in Costa Rica and I was coming back and forth to the States to do some shoots and then going to spend time in Costa Rica and edit. But I just got over the hump, saved some money. And I just, I just signed a year lease on Miami beach. And one of the top reasons that I wanted to be back here was to be around people that are at a similar frequency or at least are like really going after being excited about life and i've just started a running training program and so i can go out and run along the beach any time of day and run by dozens of people that are outside in their body moving around getting inspired and then also you know as i spend a lot of time doing video editing and digital marketing stuff with my laptop you know i i have a beautiful home to to work in but sometimes i just get kind of bored just in my own energy. And so I have like a all like I, I have like a list of all my favorite cafes that I'll like, you know, I'll all right, this time I'm gonna go for a 20 block bicycle ride along the beach and then go plant myself at Starbucks or a Panther Cafe or whatever. Just to be around other people. Even it was just a little interactions, right? Like, hey, how's your day? Oh yeah, what would you like? Oh, I'd like the a cold brew or I'd like two espresso shots on ice or something. Um Damien, did you want to chime in on this topic a little more? I'm I'm an introvert. Like, 
sometimes people energize me, but I'll be honest, like I need that, like that time in the dark to do the, all the processing. But I realized like, you know, we can become slave to our own habits and too much of one thing is a bad thing. So that's why the kind of question of like the war between like, you know, isolation and connection, but I totally feel that like, even if you are working out and like, I'm super friendly with everybody at the gym. Um, like I'm probably the loudest person there. Shocker. But uh, it, yeah, just being around other people, that's a different, different frequency, different energy because we are social beings. And if you don't do that, you kind of neglect part of yourself. And Nafska, what you were saying about, well, just ask myself, what do I need? You're in the kind of space where everything you do builds on your self-trust because mm-hmm. you trust yourself to ask the question and to follow through and to step up when need be and step back when need be. So I absolutely love that. And it starts to become this, this process where everything has to do with everything. And then when you're really in tune with yourself, and maybe you don't like the word balance, and I agree with seasons, maybe it's equilibrium. How do you keep your, how do you calibrate your equilibrium? So I think, and at, at the heart of self-trust comes the emotional intelligence emotional intelligence required to actually, Hey, I am okay. Or I'm not okay. What do I need? And just trust yourself to take those steps. Trusting in yourself to take those steps. So good. Hey, um, Nasika. So, um, I'm just trying to think about more things that I I really want to, you know, chat about while we're live on this, on this podcast. Um, so we met like five or six years ago in Boston. I think I met you through the Daybreaker community. Um, Mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering, uh, how, how does dance tie into your personal evolution? Is that part of your fitness and community journey? Like what, what is dance to you? And, you know, if you want to touch on Daybreaker or anything that comes to mind. You guys are like so tuned in. I just got to, I just got to acknowledge both of you because doing podcasting, like as co-hosts and being able to balance each other out and be like, okay, is it my turn? Is it your turn? Whatever. Like, I just need to take a moment and acknowledge both of you because you guys are incredible podcast hosts and your questions are so insightful and thoughtful. I'm like, I just got to go on a tangent for a second because your questions are so insightful and thoughtful. You're both super professional and like really thought provoking. And everything you guys are saying are like things that are going on in my life right now. I'm like, have they been reading my text messages? Like you guys, no, like literally this morning, I was talking to one of my girlfriends about self-trust and she was like, you got to trust yourself. You got to trust, you know, what's going on in your life and what's going on in your world. And then you guys are bringing up like the exact words. I'm like, what's happening? It's so cool. It's like alignment, right? We're supposed to be connected and, and meant to connect. But, and your to your question, JJ, about dance, I'm going to a dance class tonight. So I'm like, does he know? I just signed up yesterday for like this dance class. I haven't posted about it yet. I haven't posted my itinerary anywhere yet for the day. So you just like knew, but I will tell you this about dance. And I don't know how many, like if you guys have majority male or female or whatever podcast listeners or or network, but I will tell you for women, especially who are entrepreneurs in, in sales, we're in our masculine so much. And for years, I just like 99.9% of the time was always in my masculine, like go, go, go do, do, do this and that be busy, whatever. And dance has really allowed me to one, be in my feminine and really kind of start having that equilibrium, right? I love that word using it now, having that equilibrium between the masculine and the feminine, because we all need both. And like, we have this big thing happening on our team this week. It's really exciting. Today is like the final day for it. And I'm like, I'm going to a dance class tonight because I've so been in my masculine. I'm like, all right, like it's time to flow and move and dance and have fun and let go. And I'm somebody that cares what other people think about me. And that's just going to be who I am like forever. And I try and mitigate it and, you know, like not care. And it doesn't really affect me anymore, but I have cared about what I look like to other people, what I, I don't, I never like to look stupid. I never like to do things right. Like I never like to do things that I'm not good at. That's like a big thing for me. Like I hate things that I'm not good at. Right. Like who likes things they're bad at? I don't know. But like dance has really allowed me to lean into all of those things. Like I don't, I kind of look crazy sometimes. I'm definitely not perfect. I mess up the choreography. I get to be in my feminine. I don't have to care about what other people think. And 
I feel like when you're in the proper dance environment, like Daybreakers or the dance classes I take out here in Arizona, and there's so many communities out there, dance is so supportive. Like you're cheering each other on, you know, you're clapping for each other. The women are like screaming for each other and like gassing each other up and all of these things. And it's very empowering. No one cares if you mess up. No one cares if you forget about choreography. No one cares if your pants rip in the middle of class. Like it doesn't matter. Like everyone's just just there to have fun and have a good time. And I being an entrepreneur sometimes don't have a lot of fun or I don't have a lot of hobbies. It's like my career is my hobby. My work is my hobby. Like, what do you mean? And so dance has really allowed me to turn that part of my brain off, not completely, but a little bit more and just be super present in the moment. You don't have your phone when you're dancing, you know, you're learning the choreography music gets us into state and it can change your frequency and your vibration and your energy. And, and there's so many different parts and pieces that go to that. But every time I go to a dance class, it's also like personal development because I'm learning something about myself like, and not judging myself and just having fun with it, not taking it so freaking seriously. Like I take so many other things in my life. So cool to hear your story and your, your experiences. Um, wow. Yeah. You know, not taking yourself too seriously, I think is one of the most important lessons in life. You know, I think often we spend a lot of time around people in our similar age range from like 20 to 40 or whatever it is. And like in, in the more natural world is like, you should have children around, you should have old people around, you should be around all stages of life because it reminds us to be fully dynamic human beings. And one of these things is to be to, to learn something that you're not good at or to do something that you don't know how to do is uncomfortable, but that's how children learn. And there's actually been studies done that our neuroplasticity actually can be as flexible and malleable as a child's in adulthood. And it's really just this the, the mental attitudes and frameworks that hold us into, oh, I can't draw. Oh, I can't sing. Oh, no, I haven't practiced singing, but I'd love to learn, you know, whatever that may be. Um, yeah. And so thank you for the compliments. You know, we we recorded 13 hour long Zoom calls over the last five months developing this podcast, just organically allowing it to evolve um, on its own. And we've we've done a lot of um reflection with each other about the process and and it's been really cool just to see you know from the first inception we both just really wanted to create something and it's just you know every one that we do is better and better and more exciting more exciting and it's been really lovely to have you on the show and there's so much i want to reflect back to you about dance but maybe we'll get into it another time i want to actually ask you um, as we're coming up on an hour. So we'll finish up this episode and then we'll do a little post roll conversation when we, um, uh, after we sort of close the, the live episode. But I want to ask you, Nasika, what, first of all, when you hear evolution now, evolution now project, wh what are your first thoughts? Like, what does it, what does it mean to you? What do you, what do you, what do you think of? I think of, for me, evolution means growth. So when you're evolving, you're growing. And I love the word now because there's a sense of urgency where you're not growing later. You haven't already grown in the past and like you're good now. It's like you're, you're expanding in the present moment urgently. And I love that you guys are really discussing topics like this. I think especially like as men, just to be honest with you, being able to um, have those emotionally intelligent conversations and, and, and really be constantly evolving and growing and maturing and all of those things as entrepreneurs, it's basically a requirement. Um, so that's what I, what I think of. And a project, you know, is something that isn't finished, right? If you have a project, it's something that is currently work being worked on and as human beings like we're kind of like projects right like we're never gonna get to the end of our journey until we're not on earth anymore that's at least what i believe you know that we're constantly going to be growing and evolving and that we are projects in and of ourselves because like when i think of project i think of like an art project like you know in, in middle school or high school where you're like let me add this let me do this let me let me do this let me talk about 
this as part of my project in my presentation or whatever it is. And I think that as human beings, we're adding those things to ourselves constantly. We're removing things um, and we're working on ourselves. So such a beautiful, um, deep name to have as your podcast. Wonderful. Good. And, and thank you for the compliments as well. Uh, I liked how you touched on like selling the masculine and getting in touch with the feminine. And another Carl Jung quote that I love is life is found in the play of opposites in that equilibrium. And it's different per the individual. And it's just a great, it comes back to trust, emotional intelligence, perspective, awareness, and, and doing the work. So it's been an absolute pleasure um, chatting with you and connecting with you here on Evolution Now. Uh, we are right around an hour um, and we'll have closing thoughts, but before we go, I, I was wondering, is there two things? Is there a quote that you want to just throw out there and maybe talk about how it's impacted you or something that guides you? And is there any events or anything that you want to shout out coming up in your life? Hmm. I don't have a quote. Like I'm like, I could make something up off the top of my head, but I don't have a quote that really grounds me um, or that I think about. I think that the one thing that I always talk about or think about is what is the highest version of myself? Like, who is she? And just asking myself that question over and over again, like, who is the highest version of myself and who is she being in this moment? And that is like, people care more about who you be versus what you say, because your being is what makes them trust you. Your being is what makes them feel safe with you. You know, your being is what magnetizes people to you. So um, I'm always thinking about who is the woman that I'm becoming and is she the highest version of me? So that's what I'll say about that. As far as events go, um, I have two very exciting events happening. One in Arizona, September 16th, um, I will be speaking at a corporate headquarters. Um, I'm actually closing out an event. So I'm the keynote speaker for that, which is really exciting. Um, and then in, I will beginning of October be in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm um, also speaking at an event, which I'm very excited about as well, October 6th and 7th. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity as it feels like dreams are coming true and everything that I've worked on for years and years and years, you know, when JJ and I first met are coming to fruition now. And I always tell people like now is your time because you decided it. like now is the time because you've put in the work you've put in the culmination and um i feel the same for you guys it's like now is your time for whatever you're looking to create because there is this evolution just i think going on on planet earth right now and this up leveling and um just so much happening which is really exciting amazing just to finish up the thought you when you said the highest version of yourself and this is something myself and jj talked about one of our first podcasts is what does the world class version of you look like? So I would I would implore you to next time in your journaling ask like what's the world class version of you look like? And that that's a such a powerful framework where not to put pressure on, but it's to, as JJ said is to orient you in the direction of your north star. And clearly you're already doing that, but it's just a cool different perspective of the what's the highest version of myself? What's the world class version of myself? So well stated, and best of luck in those. In those um, speaking engagements, I'm I, a keynote speaker. That's very impressive, and I'm I'm sure you're going to kill it in both of them. That's wonderful. Thank yeah, thank you so much. And um, if uh, if any of our listeners and viewers want to connect with you, what's the best place for them to connect with you online? I mostly live on Instagram, so at Nafsika Official underscore is my Instagram handle. Super super cool. Um, well, okay, so. Thank you so much, Nastika, for being on this episode of Evolution Now. Um, thank you, Damien, for your wonderful questions and, and um, supportive, collaborative conversation throughout this episode. And uh, thank you out there, you viewers and listeners, for tuning in. And hopefully some of this has been inspiring and educational in some ways. And um, feel free to connect with us online, subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram, shoot us a message if you have any questions or if you'd like to be on the show. All righty. Take care. And until next time, keep growing. Keep growing. Keep growing. Keep growing.